Good evening. I'm Adam Smith. What is it that makes a brilliant investor? What are the qualities that enable a man or woman to take, let's say, $10,000 and turn it into $200,000 or $300,000? Tonight, we're going to be talking with three of the greatest investors of a generation. At least two of them are legendary. They have very different personalities, different lifestyles, different investment philosophies, but what they have in common is their enormous success. Success measured not only in the millions of dollars, but in the respect of their peers. Now, it wasn't very long ago that there came about in universities a theory, after a lot of statistical study, that said no one can beat the stock market. That if you're up one year, you're down the next and that all the information about any stock is in its price. In other words, the markets are efficient. But here are three brilliant investors who stood that theory on its ear because they have won year after year after year. The most senior in years is John Templeton, who came from the small rural town of Winchester, Tennessee, went to Yale, graduated first in his class, went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, made his first investments on the eve of World War II. He thought then that Germany's invasion of Poland would put the U.S. on a war footing and bring it out of depression. So he called a broker and bought $100 worth of every stock selling for a dollar a share or less, all on $10,000 of borrowed money. Four years later, he sold them for 40000 and he has been a bargain hunter ever since. His mutual funds all carry his name, Templeton, in their titles. The oldest of them is now 31 years old. Today, John Templeton runs his funds from the Bahamas, where he's built a home reminiscent of the antebellum mansions of his boyhood Tennessee. It's very pleasant here in the Bahamas, but how can you run a couple of billion dollars worth of investments from a surrounding like this? <laughs> Don't you have to be on Wall Street? We did move here because it is so very pleasant, but we now have found that in the 22 years we've lived here, the performance of our mutual funds is better than in the 25 years we were managing them from Radio City in New York. Well, how do you account for this? I mean, you could work at Radio City and do things differently. Yes, we tried to, but we go to the same meetings as the other security analysts and the people who speak are so sensible that we can't help being influenced. It's much easier to be odd when you're a thousand miles away. Trying to be odd, going against the herd, has been a Templeton trademark as he searches for bargains that others have overlooked. How do you know, you, you've always said that you should sell when the, when the herd is happiest and buy when it's gloomy. How do you know when the herd is gloomy that it isn't right? <laughs> Sometimes they are. And of course, we make hundreds of mistakes all the time. But we have found from the very time we started our investment council operation 44 years ago, we published as the motto of our business to buy when others or despondently selling and to sell when others are avidly buying requires the greatest fortitude and pays the greatest reward. Now this applies not only to stock market cycles, but it applies to particular industries and types of stocks. Basically, we determine that by finding out what is selling at a depressed price. If a, a stock is selling for a quarter or a half of what it's worth, then uh, it is a bargain and is, in most cases, unpopular with other investors. Mainly, you like to buy companies that are out of favor. For example, I noticed that your biggest position is in Royal Dutch, but everybody's expecting oil prices to go down. Doesn't that bother you? Oh, yes, of course it bothers us. But there's so many other factors. We do own a very large amount. In fact, I think Royal Dutch Petroleum is the largest holding in our mutual funds because at the present price, it's selling for only four times what we think it will earn this year. And we estimate that uh, in the long run, it will earn more. And it, we, it's selling for less than half what it could liquidate for, and only about three times its present annual cash flow, and pays a good dividend. So for many, many reasons, it looks like the best bargain in the energy industry. It's very widely expected that there will be a decrease in the price of oil. And if the, the low point for share prices is when the most investors are expecting bad news, not after the bad news comes out. Now, it is possible that it might get lower, but we are long-range investors. Our average holding period is six years. Six years. 
So in the long run, it'll be worth much more. Your global fund looks all over the world for investments, and I noticed that a couple of years ago, you were heavily into Japan, and now you've brought all that money practically back to the United States. Isn't that true? Is that a temporary phenomenon? Yes, that is temporary. Uh, we are worldwide bargain hunters. We search all over the world and make estimates of the values of each corporation and then buy those shares that have the lowest market price at the time in relation to our estimate of value. And at one time, that was in Japan. In that one nation alone, we had over 50% of our total investments because we were buying the very finest companies at three times earnings, some at two times earnings. But now, instead of 50% in Japan, we're less than 3% in Japan because meanwhile, the prices there have gone up. The Dow Jones Industrial Average in Japan is now over 25 times earnings. And the index of smaller companies in Japan is over 41 times earnings. So that now they're very difficult and very few bargains to be found there and more bargains to be found in America and other nations. So if you're looking around the world, what country or countries would you pick as the, as the best shot? We never approach it that way. Almost all security analysts ask themselves which nation and which industry before they make a selection. If no one were doing it, that would be a good method. But since uh, w the best results are obtained by in those areas where other security analysts are not working, we just say we will buy the best bargain we can find, then later find out what nation it's in. Now approaching it from that end, we have found an unusually large amount of bargains recently in the United States, also in Canada, and in Australia, and in the Netherlands. John, three years ago, you said that you could see the Dow Jones at 3,000 within five years, which was almost a triple and certainly a double. You have two years left on that prediction. Do you hold by it? <laughs> we keep changing. <laughs> uh, what I said, and I, we do not ordinarily make predictions, but I said that the chances were as good as even that that would happen. And I'm saying today that the chances are as good as even that the Dow Jones someday might be above 3,000 before the next presidential election three and a half years from now. We base that on a long list of reasons, partly based on value and partly based on cash available. How do you feel personally about the current takeover mania? Uh, it's an illustration that share prices are among the best bargains in the world. This takeover mania uh, proves the fact that corporations on the stock exchange are selling for much less than they're really worth. Also, the same thing is proven by the fact that more corporations than ever are buying in their own shares. So that it's an, a further evidence that values are unusually low now. Academicians have a theory that no one can beat the market consistently, that the markets are efficient, that every, all the news is already in the price. And yet there are a handful of great investors who have single-handedly disproved that theory by consistently beating the market over a period of many years, and you are one of them. How would you distinguish yourself, say, from Philip Fisher or Warren Buffett? Uh, probably in the fact that I look worldwide more than the others do and search in a wider variety of areas. Probably because I'm willing to make estimates of earning power further into the future than others are and certainly because I rely on prayer in everything we do. We open all of our directors meetings with prayer. We pray about every decision we make and in the long run that means you will still make hundreds of mistakes but less mistakes than otherwise. Did they ask you whether you prayed for stocks to go up? Well, yes. That would not work, of course. Uh, if we prayed for something we bought to go up, uh, it would be ridiculous. So instead of that, I think we would try to follow Solomon who prayed for wisdom.